Uh, I am Joe O'Keefe, Dean of the Lynch School of Education, and on behalf of all of my colleagues and the faculty and staff, delighted to welcome home to campus many of our alums whom I've seen, delighted to welcome students uh, who are here to participate in this wonderful event. Without, uh, several years ago, a group of students approached Associate Jean John, uh, Dean John Cawthorn with a wonderful proposal. Uh, undergraduates who want to honor the teachers who had an, a big impact on their lives, a formative and inspiring impact on their lives. And we have recognized teachers of our undergraduates uh, now for several years. And I am delighted that we will do so again tonight. So without further ado, uh, I would like ask, ask, to ask Dean John Cawthorn now to introduce this phase of our program. John. Thank you. Uh, the words I have prepared were to follow. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure how they fit coming before. Uh, the, the, the topic of today's symposium is readiness for college. And when we think about that, we think of two groups of people who have the primary responsibility for preparing children for college, parents and teachers. Now, we don't get to choose our parents. We don't always get to choose our teachers. But everyone in this room, everyone at this university, has been touched by at least one incredible teacher in their life. And it's fitting that a school of education should stop periodically and honor those people who made it possible for us to be here. There's a young woman who's a freshman who wants to major in chemistry and secondary education. Her parents said, chemistry, yes, but not teaching, because we are a family of engineers. And I spoke with this young lady over the course of the summer, and she finally got up the nerve to say to her parents, well, where do you think the engineers came from? They came from extraordinary teachers. She will be majoring in chemistry and secondary education. <clears throat> I'm privileged to work with some extraordinary undergraduates in the Lynch School Senate, and they're the ones who sponsor this. And this evening, to introduce them is the co-chair, who happens to be the only chair who's stateside this semester, since her other co-chair is in Italy. But I also have to tell you that we have some bad news. Allison O'Connor, who's the student who nominated Patricia Cervasi, is ill with the flu. She cannot be here today. And we wish her all well. And Mrs. Cervasi, Cervasi, uh, had a, an unfortunate death in the family, and she cannot be here with us. And we wish her well, and we wish her and her family, we send our condolences to them. Okay. So now I'm going to ask Robin Antonucci, who's the co-chair of the Senate, to come and to introduce uh, this year's nominator and this year's nominee. Robin? For many aspiring educators, a past teacher's influence has motivated them and inspired them to make an impact on others. A great teacher is one who gets us to think and act in ways that we never would have otherwise. These teachers compel us to see beyond the normal limits of the classroom. They challenge us, believe in us, and instill in us their own passion. For this reason, the Lynch School has chosen to take this opportunity to honor those teachers who have made a lasting impact on their past students. The annual Honoring Teachers program highlights the accomplishments of educators. The seniors were given an opportunity to nominate an exemplary teacher, one whose influence is still present despite time apart. These teachers have gone above and beyond their call of duty, and we are honored to take this time to thank them for all of their hard work. So I'd like to introduce Carrie Kennedy, who will introduce her teacher. Hi, 
everyone. Um, so I'm an elementary education and English major at BC. This is my senior year. Um, and as a teacher ed major, I've started collecting um, a bunch of, of inspirational teacher quotes that I tend to look at from time to time. Uh, and I was looking through them recently and found one that I think really reflects on the relationship that I have with Ms. Miller, who I nominated for this award today. Um, the quote is by Dan Rather, and it says, the dream begins with a teacher who believes in you. I think this quote fits my relationship with Ms. Miller perfectly because of the ways that I changed in just one year with her believing in me. I remember my first presentation in her class, my senior year of high school, and she recorded that I said, um, 48 times in that five to seven minute brief presentation, which was the most out of any person in the entire class. Um, so clearly I was lacking confidence in myself and self-esteem, uh, was a little bit nervous speaking in front of large groups. Within a year, I gave a flawless speech at graduation. So I came a very long way. And while it may seem trivial, it was something that really demonstrated how much I had changed with her guiding me through. The open and friendly atmosphere that Ms. Miller created as my teacher, in addition to the professional development that she encouraged, allowed me to really feel confident in myself um, and in my, my personal aspirations. She helped me to pursue a career in elementary education, allowed me to explore schools and classrooms around the county, and how to, taught me how to walk into a school, hold my head high, find who I needed to meet, shake their hand and say hello, I'm Miss Carrie Kennedy, I'll be working with you today, which is a big step for a high school senior. Most importantly, I first learned from Ms. Miller how to be independent. Her high expectations led me to do my absolute best and sparked within me a desire to try new things. Boston College was the first step of that desire to try new things. So here I stand today, a senior in college who is currently halfway done with her full practicum teaching experience. Uh, ready to be begin a career in urban education and hopefully pursue an international educational experience as well if I get my Fulbright grant to South Africa. And I don't think I would have made it this far if it wasn't for her. I may not have even made it to BC if it wasn't for her. So I wrote this in my application, but I'll say it again. Um, I will never forget something that Ms. Miller told us that year, uh, right before we left her class. She said that if you can touch the heart of just one student as a teacher, you've succeeded. Uh, so I think that Ms. Miller deserves this award today as a reminder and a thank you of the way that she succeeded in touching mine. Wow, <laughs> thank you. It's really such an honor to be here today. An honor to be in this room full of educators, people on their way to becoming an educator, probably many of you who have been in the field of education for a really long time. And those of you who have been realize what a wonderful place it is to be. For me, the most exciting part of today, honestly, is getting to see Carrie again. I feel really, really lucky to be a teacher. I love my job every day I walk into a classroom. And to be able to come back after four years and see a former student who has been so successful, I, I like to think that I touch the heart of my students, but honestly, my students touch my heart every day. This means so much to me. Thank you. A wonderful reminder of the nobility of this vocation that we have to teach. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for coming in and accepting this honor and uh, honoring us with your presence on campus. Thank you very much. I would now, it's my pleasure to introduce the Provost of Boston College, uh, Dr. Cutbero Garza, uh, who will speak some words of welcome on behalf of the university. Bert. Well, um, a very warm welcome, the president, uh, from the president and, uh, and obviously from uh, from uh, the entire community, to those of you that are visiting, to our students, and especially to Mr. Secretary. Um, in thinking about this gathering and its theme, um, I thought about the message that uh, Father Leahy, the president at, at BC, shared with us at convocation this year, uh, faculty convocation, or the university convocation, which was think anew, act anew. 
for universities, we probably have been facing the most, one of the most challenging periods that universities have, have lived through in the last 24 months, uh, not only because of the financial uh, issues that all universities have faced, but because of a number of other happenings. Chief among them, I think, is the reality that is, is presenting itself with ever greater focus of how much more important education is becoming. And the theme of today's conference, I think, illustrates that uh, remarkably well. There are new economic realities that we have to face. Many of us are now probably going to experience less of a, a job increase than many of us expected. Some are even describing it as a jobless recovery from the, the current recession. In the past, just to illustrate this, estimates are that we used to create about 1,000 jobs for uh, any manufacturing facility that was the size of a football field. Today, that number is closer to two to 400. I mean, that's a remarkable difference. Why? Because the robots are doing much more of this, and the technological advances are having a, a marked decrease in the job intensity of any activity. There are new global realities. Our oceans are no longer protecting us quite to the degree they did in the past. They're not isolating us as, as they used to. Um, it is truly, uh, and now even with global warming, a smaller world. The idea of a passage th through the Arctic is no longer an impossibility. Making traffic from one end of the world to another much quicker. Expectations are rising globally. The vast increases in information technology are making everyone aware of how one can live a good life. And there is rising competition. That last one, I, I suppose, is among the most pertinent messages for us. There was a report issued last month by the OECD. It's a group of industrialized countries that get together and try to pre uh, predict, based on current happenings, what the world has to, to look forward to. And for the US, its findings, vis-a-vis uh, -vis education and college, are, are quite remarkable. The major finding, one of the major findings at least, is that in the majority of countries that were surveyed, the number of people leaving school at the minimum age permitted in the various countries is declining in, in most. Similarly, the number of workers that are entering the labor market without completing high school uh, is declining. In the US, both numbers are increasing. In terms of enrollment rates, the US currently ranks behind South Korea, Finland, Greece, Slovakia, and Taiwan in terms of the population entering college or university. In terms of numbers that have graduated from college or university, the US ranks behind Canada, Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Ireland, Norway, France, Belgium, Australia, and the list goes on. In terms of trends in the percentage of young people entering colleges and universities, the US has fallen behind Australia, Poland, New Zealand, the Slovak Republic, Iceland, Sweden, and the list grow, uh, grows on. This means that between 1998 and 2006, the percentage of students entering college increased at a greater rate in those countries than in the US. The challenge we have is not only in readiness for college, for the numbers that we currently have, but increasing that readiness across the board. I can't over, overstate the remarkable role educators in the audience are playing in helping meet that challenge, uh, or for those of you that are studying to enter that noble profession, the increasing importance you will play uh, uh, in helping the US meet uh, those challenges. So to each of you that are here today to help us examine that topic, uh, to, the uh, to the Secretary of Education, uh, thank you for coming and helping us better understand how, in fact, we're going to meet that future um, with everything we've got. Thank you.
I'm extremely grateful to have our keynote speaker with us today, Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Paul Revel. Uh, prior to assuming his appointment as Secretary in July 2008, Secretary Revel served as Chairman of the Massachusetts State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. He also served on the Governor's Transition Team, was Chair of the Governor's Pre-K through 12 Task Force on Governance, and was the founding president of the Rennie Center for Educational Research and Policy. He also served as director of the Education Policy and Management Program and a senior lecturer on educational policy at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. In addition to his numerous school reform appointments over the past two decades, Secretary Revel is the former education director of the Pew Forum on Standards-Based Reform, a national organization focused on improving standards and academic expectations for students. And he was the founding executive director of the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education, a leading group behind the Education Reform Act of 1993. He was also the founding executive director of the Alliance for Education, a multi-service educational improvement organization serving Worcester and central Massachusetts. Prior to his work at the Alliance, Secretary Revel was the principal executive director and a teacher at two alternative secondary schools in Massachusetts. He earned his bachelor's degree from Colorado College and holds a master's degree in education from Stanford University. I want to take this opportunity uh, not only to welcome Secretary Revel, but to thank him uh, for his work to create a unified education system in the Commonwealth, uh, providing uh, opportunities for links across the lifespan of our young people. Uh, today you will hear about some of our work uh, on this campus to ready young people for college. Uh, we partner with Massachusetts schools, public and Catholic schools, especially other private schools, on a wide variety of research projects and outreach initiatives. And in fact, thanks to a generous endowment, uh, we have uh, just celebrated 10 years of the Collaborative Fellows Program, research on issues of practice that emanate from uh, the needs of practitioners in the Boston Public Schools, and research that is always, by definition, conducted collaboratively. Uh, you will see that many of the um, outreach activities and research activities are demonstrated uh, around the room. And so I think we share the common mission of readiness for college. And I often say uh, to people within schools, not only uh, is getting into college the important issue, it's getting out of college. Uh, and we stand as partners with all of our colleagues in the Commonwealth and around the nation to do that. Uh, in response to Secretary Revel's remarks, uh, you will hear from two of our faculty members about their important work uh, related to college readiness. Uh, David Bluestein, long-standing work uh, on vocational education, understanding the dynamics, uh, psychological dynamics of readiness for college, of future, and of work. Um, highly published in that domain, and especially a lot of work in Brighton High School with the Tools for Tomorrow and the West Roxbury campus of the Boston Public Schools, uh, working with Boston Public School students on college readiness. Uh, also, Karen Arnold, our Associate Professor in our Department of Educational Administration and Higher Education, uh, will speak from her perspective as a developmentalist, understanding issues of readiness and how those issues get worked out in the college environment. So I think the topic, as um, um, Provost Garza said, the topic is indeed an important one, and the speakers that we have tonight, I am certain, will give us um, tremendous insights into this important issue and will help us to continue in our mission at the Lynch School of making sure that educational attainment is something that is for everyone, not just a few, uh, which is so much a part of the legacy and history of Boston College, of this institution, of providing educational opportunities. So Secretary Revel, a warm welcome to the Heights. Welcome to Boston College. And thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Dean O'Keefe, for that warm welcome. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be uh, your speaker on such an auspicious occasion. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be among your faculty. There are many people in this audience and on this faculty whose work I've long admired. I will dangerously just mention two. Erwin Blummer has been one of my heroes in the world of education leadership. And <clears throat> 
education policy, and I've learned many lessons from watching him at his work, and he's someone I've known quite well over the years. Someone I've known less well, but whose work I've admired from a distance is Mary Walsh. I think these two individuals are emblematic <laughs> the whole Boston Connects program, about which I'm going to say more later, emblematic of this institution's commitment to not just uh, standing aside on the heights and looking down on education and commenting on it, but actually rolling up your sleeves and being deeply engaged in it in the best sense of a professional school. So I have great admiration for you and your work here at Boston College, and uh, again, I'm honored to be with you. I'm, I'm especially um, tickled by the uh, teachers who've been honored today. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful practice. Sometimes in my classes uh, at, at Harvard, I ask uh, students to think about the teachers that they've had who've been most effective with them over time. And it's a fascinating exercise and tells us a lot about the quality of teaching and what we mean about high quality teaching because the portraits of teachers that emerge from that exercise of thinking about a teacher who most influenced you, who you thought was most effective, uh, produces some really interesting results. But I, I the, you know, this notion that we as teachers have um, the sort of blessed occupation of planting seeds that grow into the future uh, reminded me very much of your comments uh, in, in terms of looking at a former student up in front of an audience like this today. So I think that's a wonderful thing that you do in that way. I've been asked to speak about readiness for college. I'm actually going to approach it a little bit differently uh, maybe than had been anticipated. I'm going to approach it from the standpoint of education policy and somebody who's concerned and whose job is to look at systems of education and how to improve those systems to deliver the result of readiness for college. You know, at a very top level, <clears throat> in a room like this, in most rooms where we bring together people who care about education, we can get agreement about what we want to do for our young people and what we want to do for our society when we make statements like we want to we want to have an education system that guarantees each and every child and all means all access to a high quality, excellent school in a system that's equitable, that's fair for everybody who participates in it. When we move beneath that top level, 30,000 feet, and take it down to the level of strategy, we often have strenuous disagreements as to which strategies will take us to that goal, to that objective. Somewhere in between is a statement about what does that actually look like, a system of excellent schools. And that's where I think college readiness comes in. And I, you know, we're at an auspicious moment, I think, uh, nationally as well as at the state level and local level where we have a convergence of many different perspectives coming from government, coming from the philanthropic world, coming from the intergovernmental system at the federal level, the state level, at the local level. And people are beginning to say, well, you know, an excellent system is a system that prepares each and every one of our students to be ready for college and ready for a challenging career. So that college readiness is rapidly emerging here as a uh, de facto national goal for education, what our education systems ought to be producing. So someone in a position like mine has to then think about how do we design an education system that would produce that result. And that's what I want to talk with you a little bit about today. And I particularly want to take cognizance of the fact that I'm at a school of education. I'm a creature of a school of education myself, so I'm not pontificating to you from any other perspective than that of a colleague. But being in a school of education, I want to talk about the particular challenges that we face in helping society meet this goal of readying all of our children uh, for college and career. And it's a particularly auspicious day to do that because um, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan uh, was at Teachers College earlier in the day and made a speech on this exact topic. And I promise you I haven't plagiarized his speech. I did look at it. I did actually coincidentally had a phone conversation with him last night though we didn't talk about this. But it's a very worthwhile speech so I commend it to your attention. You could find it on the U.S. Department of Education's uh, website. Uh, but, and some of the themes are, are, are certainly the, the same. So the way I'd like to start is by saying we live in very challenging times now. Times of change, times of some urgency, times of stress. Certainly most of my life is spent uh, apportioning cuts to our budget, uh, the latest round of cuts. 
And at times when there is a widespread recognition that we need to build a 21st century education system, one that will succeed in preparing all of our students, uh, not only to be college and, and career ready, <clears throat> but also to, more importantly, to be successful in the general sense of a term. And part of that success, to be sure, includes employment, although I'm quick to add, not all of education is about preparing people for employment. At the same time, if we, don't, if we are not attentive to the employment needs of our students and our society, we're neglecting one of our chief responsibilities as educators. So what I mean by success is preparing young people for 21st century employment where they can have a meaningful job in a 21st century economy and exercise some leadership in that job, preparing them to be citizens in our democracy in a democracy that's quite different now than it was even 20 or 30 years ago, to be leaders in that democracy, to be successful as heads of families and communities in our society, and finally, to be successful as lifelong learners. That's the goal that we have. And in order to get there, <clears throat> there are a number of challenges we face. And I think there's some particular challenges that, that we as for example, state government in this case need your help as a school of education or as young educators, and I see so many of you in the audience, and thank you for your commitment and, and for being here. Uh, we need your help in meeting these challenges. So they're challenges that we share in ed schools and between ed schools and state government. And I have about seven of them that I want to talk about uh, with you briefly this afternoon. The first one is help us build 21st century schools Help us define what that means and what a 21st century school looks like. A school in which all students have the opportunity to de demonstrate subject matter mastery and the ability to apply the knowledge uh, to succeed in college and career. We have a system now which for the most part was very well suited, is very well suited to meet the needs of the early 20th century in a society that was rapidly industrializing, rapidly urbanizing, rapidly sending large numbers of uh, young people into low-skill, low-knowledge uh, manufacturing jobs. And that system actually served us pretty well for the first three quarters of the 20th century. But then the realities around us changed, and many of those jobs that once enabled young people to uh, earn the American dream and live the American dream uh, and have a middle-class life and a middle-class all kinds of middle class privileges and prerogatives. Those jobs began to either be automated or go offshore, and we rapidly became, by default, moving in the direction of a high knowledge, high skill economy. And we needed, instead of having a bell curve distribution of educational achievement, we needed to have everybody at the high end of the distribution with high skills and high knowledge able to, able to do intensive post-industrial information age jobs in the 21st century and we don't have a system that's set up to do that. We have a mass production, batch processing, one size fits all kind of an education delivery system that is really set up in ways that better fit an agrarian age than a post-industrial information age. So we need to build that new system in which all students are enabled to be proficient in multiple subjects and possess the ability to think quickly and creatively to solve problems and have the skill and aptitude to get it done. Uh, and this is a huge job. And the need is very real. Uh, for example, when we look at our own uh, labor and workforce development statistics, we see that approximately 60% of all the new jobs created between now and 2016 here in Massachusetts alone will require an associate's degree or higher, which is why the governor a couple of years ago announced that it is our goal as an administration, uh, we've been handicapped by the budget crisis, to make post-secondary education at the level of community college free for all the residents in the Commonwealth because we think that some form of post-secondary education is going to be an absolute prerequisite to be successful in the 21st century and we need to move in that direction. That same report um, lets us know that 11 of the 20th, 20 fastest growing occupations in Massachusetts are concentrated in healthcare and information technology, with another four in the life sciences, so that you have 15 of the 20, 20 fastest growing occupations in STEM fields here in Massachusetts. And you'd think we'd be a rich, resourceful place to do that with a bubbling labor market ready to take those jobs. 
But when the SAT recently measured young people's interest as they went on to college in majors in the STEM fields or in uh, careers in STEM fields, the national average is about 26% of students at that juncture indicate such an interest. And when <clears throat> you look at Massachusetts results, it's actually a startling 20%. So we're below average on the level of interest that our young people have in STEM careers, and yet STEM careers are going to be uh, the future of this economy. Then if we look in higher education, and we talked about, you know, and, and uh, Joe O'Keefe made a good point about we're not just talking about getting people into college, but getting people through college. As people move through college, we find that roughly a third who sign up to be majors in our public higher education system in STEM subjects drop out of those, excuse me, two-thirds drop out of those subjects over the course of their college career. Uh, so we've got some real challenges in that regard. What do 21st century schools look like? Well, you can help us define that as a place like this. Here are some of my <coughs> notions about that. First of all, we need broader, deeper, higher expectations for our students. We need, and this is something I've campaigned on uh, for the past 20 years of my career, a very different use of time. We need an education system that finds every child where he or she is in early childhood education, in, in, er, in their early years, provides them with the early education and care that they need to enter the K-12 system and be successful there and move on to some level of post-secondary education, again, to emerge at the end of this process of public education uh, ready for success. And that time will be differentiated. Our children bring different levels of experience different kinds of intellectual and social assets and or deficits into school with them. And so it stands to reason that we've got to differentiate our approach as we educate each and every one of these children. We need, for example, to apply technology to this problem of differentiating between children. It's pervasive in the lives of children outside of schools and underutilized or barely utilized in many of our educational environments. We need to include, and here's where you've set, I think, a wonderful example with Boston Connects, wraparound health and human services in our education system if we're, going to, if we're going to genuinely have a situation where each and every one of our children comes to school ready to learn. Governor and I have a theory of action that was incorporated in the report of our readiness project, which is in order to get to success, as we defined it way back in 1993, where people like Irwin and myself worked on the Education Reform Act here in Massachusetts. The goal was <clears throat> to get all of our students to proficiency, to ready all of our students for success. And we've done a wonderful job in Massachusetts. We lead the nation in virtually every category on lots and lots of different indices. And yet when you peel that back, you find startling, profound, disturbing, persistent achievement gaps that are as large or larger than they are in most other states, actually, even though the floor starts higher. So <clears throat> we need, in order to rectify that situation and close those gaps, not only the legacy gaps between different subgroups that we have, but the gaps between our students on average and students in other countries, in order to close those gaps, we've got to really do two things as in, a, in a large theory of action. One is to improve the quality of teaching and learning in every classroom, in every daycare or early childhood center, every K-12 classroom, every higher ed classroom in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And secondly, we need to do whatever we need to do to provide the kinds of advantages to children who don't come by them by virtue of birth every sort of health and human services, social, recreational, education with a capital E as your children and my children might receive it 24 hours a day virtually, around the clock, around the year. That's the platform of advantage and opportunity that the kids who routinely derive success from our K-12 system typically enjoy. We're talking about averages here. So we wanna do for all children what those of us who've had the advantage and the blessing of privilege are able to do for our own children. And we've got to figure out how to do that, and a program like Boston Connects begins to point the way. The broadening and deepening of <clears throat> what we want to accomplish in these 21st century skills uh, schools speaks to the subject of 21st century skills, and we've been at work on that. Uh, President Obama spoke about this in his first education speech 
<clears throat> he said, I'm calling on our nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessments that don't simply measure whether or not students can fill in a bubble on a test, but whether they possess 21st century skills like problem solving and critical thinking and entrepreneurship and creativity. So what do these 21st century skills look like? They're not soft skills. They're not unattainable or incalculable. We measure them every day. Our partners in the business communities are clear in what is lacking in today's students as they enter the workforce and they tell us about it repeatedly. And there's skills like these that they're asking for, the capacity to be effective and persuasive in oral and written communication, to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, to think, as the cliche would have it, outside the box, uh, professionalism and having a work ethic, teamwork, virtually all work in uh, our economy these days is done in some way, shape, or form in teams and the capacity to collaborate is something that our students, in addition to all the basic skills and the core subjects that we appropriately insist on, they need to have the ability to collaborate. Working with diversity in an increasingly diverse society, applying technology to contemporary problems, the capacity to lead and manage uh, complicated projects. So that's a little bit of a glimpse of what I think some of the elements of 21st century skills are and the challenge to institutions like this one or for that matter um, the uh, place where I taught is to find a, a, an array of partnerships that enable you not just to study that work and help to find the work and research the work but actually to participate in it and you're obviously doing that from the host of different kinds of collaborations uh, that you have. Joe mentioned a few and I've observed others uh, from my many dealings with your faculty and students over the years. Uh, we have just put up a measure that invites colleges and universities to petition school committees to take the responsibility for actually operating under contract public schools that continue to exist within the school system. These are called readiness schools. And one of the challenges is to challenge institutions like the Lynch School to step up and operate one of those schools uh, and play an important role and take real responsibility and ownership uh, for improving the performance of a particular school and, and, and group of children. Uh, and at the same time, to stand up for this notion of 21st century schools because we have many Luddites in our midst. We have many reasons within and outside the profession to resist a new vision for where we need to go in education. And we need strong, passionate, well-informed advocates arguing for that vision uh, that I've described. Okay, a second challenge, and one directly to the point of the work that you do here, is help us build a more attractive, sustaining, and successful teaching profession. We're facing a huge turnover as uh, so many people move toward retirement. So many people of my generation move toward retirement. We need to recruit people like those in this room, the best and brightest students we can find, and not only draw them into the profession, prepare them adequately to meet the challenges of the profession, provide them with a sustaining profession that develops their talent and makes it an appealing place to stay, at least for a reasonable amount of time. When in the city in which we are now standing or sitting, we lose over half the teachers after three years of service, a place where it's attractive to live and teachers are paid well, we have a problem with the teaching profession. It's not attractive enough, it's not sustaining enough, we're not developing talent the way we should. We spend 80% of our public school budgets on people, and yet we still have a fairly primitive human resource development system there, and we need your help in building that out. We need, <clears throat> Uh, especially to uh, expand our notion of teacher preparation into the first several years of service in the teaching profession. A teacher preparation program shouldn't end when somebody walks across the stage and, re and receives a diploma. Uh, there needs to be, I think, an activist role for ed schools in supporting teachers in those early years of work. Frankly, school systems have not been able to step up and do this job for the most part, especially urban systems, as well as they should. They need help. We need your help on that. We need to do a better job as we prepare teachers on content as well as methods, on topics that we sometimes skirt like classroom management. Arne Duncan said in his remarks today, quote, it takes a whole university 
to prepare a teacher, unquote. And I think we need to take that to heart. At the same time, and this is an issue of time, we need more direct, expertly supervised experience. Programs like the teacher residency program have great promise. We need to educate and develop teachers who have more experience, expertise, comfort, and facility in interpreting data on student performance and using that to modify and improve teacher performance. We need your help in strengthening mentoring programs that we have in schools, in providing ongoing support and professional development to our teachers, in improving and giving us models for improving the supervision and evaluation of teachers. I ask my students all the time at Harvard, many, many students who I have who are refugees from some of our biggest uh, urban school systems in the country, what it was that caused them to leave uh, the uh, profession of teaching and, and pursue a career in something as remote uh, and abstruse as policy. And uh, you know, one of the questions I asked them is, what kind, of, what kind of mentoring and induction did you have? And what kind of professional development did you have? And what kind of supervision and evaluation? And the answers over a dozen years of teaching this course have been very disappointing for the most part. You know, we have a few more mentoring programs lately, but by and large, very little induction. Thrust people in the room, close the door, and leave them on their own to do the work. When it comes to professional development, too much inspirational speakers coming into the room and leaving and not really helping me in a meaningful way to better manage and succeed at my, respons as my, at my responsibilities as a, as a young teacher. And way too much in the way of drive-by supervision and evaluation. And now we have the federal government calling for us to do a better job of connecting student performance with teacher performance. And that's not an unreasonable expectation. We've got some real challenges in terms of how you link up data and how you make that connection valid and reliable. But I gotta tell you, it's a common sense connection for the general public. They figure, they know there's some connection between high quality teaching and high quality learning and student and family satisfaction in schools. And we've gotta figure out with your help how to measure that, how to develop a 360 degree portrait of a teacher and how to develop a figure of merit which we can make consequential so that we have a system where we reward excellence and we sanction underperformance because the alternative if we don't do those things is mediocrity. We've got to find better ways to restructure compensation for teachers and to solve key problems like teacher distribution. We've got to help, we need your help in building genuine career ladders and we need to uh, take advantage of opportunities. We've just put up six readiness centers around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in which we're inviting university partners to come and help us provide ongoing professional development uh, to people in the field of education, and we could use your help there. Okay, I'm gonna run through my time, so I'm gonna speed up. There are other challenges we need your help with. We need the development of a cadre of 21st century school leaders. I know you work hard on that here, and I know you agree with me that there's nothing more important than leadership in making a good school. It's the one almost universal characteristic of a highly performing school, the kind of school that when you walk in the front door and you're there for 10 minutes, you know whether it's a good school or not, and it usually revolves around leadership. We need better models of pre-service and in-service. We need better pipelines. We need much more effective training and ongoing support for teachers, uh, for leaders in the field on key issues like instructional leadership. And indeed, I think we need new conceptions of leadership to begin with where we parse out some of these management responsibilities that consume way too much of the time of our educational leaders and allow them to focus on the business of improving the quality of teaching and learning. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next thing, uh, next challenge is we need your help in building the capacity building our capacity to turn around underperforming schools. This is one of the lead challenges. Federal government is going right after it. Big organizations like the Gates Foundation going right after it. They're asking us at the state level, we're asking you in turn for your expertise, how do we do better at developing the capacity of a, in effect, a turnaround industry who can go into schools that have been chronically underperforming and with the right points of entry and with the right points of leverage, make a difference. We need to identify successful turnaround strategies and implement those uh, widely. I've long felt that our, our ed schools and universities need SWAT teams that are capable of going into these situations and, and helping us build a, a turnaround field. 
We have legislation now on innovation and turnaround in schools, uh, and we need help. We're, we're taking, for example, models from some of our best performing charter schools and applying it to the weakest points in our education system. At the same time, we're challenging educators in the mainstream system to make charter-like autonomies and flexibilities available within that mainstream system and inviting educators themselves and teachers in particular to step up and take ownership of the operation of public schools and operate them under performance contracts with school boards. We think that's the way of the future. We think that's what a 21st century education system looks like. Next challenge, number five, we need to provide more connections linking students and teachers in K-12 to higher education. We need to build the connective tissue. That's partly why Governor Patrick created an executive office of education and a secretary of education to link the different sectors. <clears throat> there's a lot in this regard obviously already happening at Boston College, but there's a need to do more. We've got programs like dual enrollment and early college, uh, early college high schools. We've got opportunities in the STEM fields. We've got advanced placement needs that are going unmet in our high schools. We've got massive professional development needs. We need a much more rigorous, robust conversation between college faculty and secondary school faculty on expectations for college readiness. What does it actually mean in terms of what a student needs to know and be able to do? What kind of dispositions are going to be helpful in coming to college? How well do they need to be able to know and do those things? Uh, we have a massive dropout challenge that's going on. We just had a, a release of a major report yesterday. And we're calling on, because we have no money as a state, we have less than no money, we're going backwards. So we need partners. To, to reach out to partners in the world of higher education, of philanthropy, uh, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs, and we're inviting them in to help us stem the tide of 11,000 students a year who drop out of our schools. Talk about achievement gaps. Those are the biggest gaps that we have. Next challenge is to help us build a research base on what works, what doesn't, and how to scale. And you do a lot of that day in and day out here, I know. Help us to learn how to innovate intelligently. The public sector is not necessarily known for its appetite for innovation, and there are lots of reasons for that. We need your help, and we need your spur, and we need your evidence that will show us what direction in which to move and how to move there. Make your research real. Make it meaningful. Make it more than a conversation at AERA, but something that actually guides policy and practice. And this takes effort that moves beyond just the doing of the research, but focuses exclusively on how you make that research have a meaningful impact in the field. And my own belief, and I, I would say this if it, I were on my home faculty, is we don't spend enough time translating that research in ways that are meaningful and will make a difference in places like the communities of policy and, and practice. And finally, I'd say the challenge is to be advocates, keep us on course. Don't sit by silently, be bold, be a partner, be unapologetic in your advocacy and your work and demand accountability of those of us who are in the public sector. Arnie Duncan issued a similar kind of challenge as I said today at Teachers College um, and, and he chose a school of education for the very same reason that I cho choose to make these remarks here today. You play a critical role in places like the Lynch School and uh, uh, in, in preparing teachers and leaders, in building the research base that helps us guide strategy and policy and practice. We need you, we need your help in responding to these challenges. We know that we in government need to do more, to work differently, to work more effectively, to be able to stop doing things that we're currently doing that aren't effective and embrace new strategies and approaches, uh, notwithstanding the political consequences of doing so. We believe that we can be successful. We believe that there's no more important work in this world than the work that we in this room are embarked on, that of educating all of our young people to their full potential. No state, no nation can build a 21st century school or school system without help. We need your partnership in doing this work and in meeting those challenges uh, that I described today. I'm convinced that our future as a commonwealth and as a nation 
is dependent on our ability to educate all of our students and prepare them to be college and career ready and set them on the path to achievement, to success, and to lifelong learning. And I look forward to working in partnership with you on meeting those challenges that I've described uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I want to thank Secretary Revel for um, the acknowledgement of the work that we do here at the Lynch School, and certainly if we needed an agenda for action moving forward, you have amply provided us uh, with an agenda for future action. Uh, it's now my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Professor Karen Arnold and then Professor David Bluestein, and after they have finished their presentations here, I would ask the three speakers to go to the uh, platform where we will have some time for question and an answer. Karen. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to respond to our distinguished speaker on this very important topic. Lest my title mislead you, I am in favor of readiness for college. <laughs> However, I, I, I intend to argue that although it's probably the foundational building block for college access, it is only one part. It's not the building. And in so doing, I'll give you a glimpse of, I think, the kind of 21st century school that the Secretary is calling for, and also a rather sobering glimpse of the complexities of increasing the number of students who go to uh, college and attain the degree. And I do all this as uh, through my role as director of the big picture longitudinal study which is four years into a 15-year study of a national and now international network of innovative uh, urban schools. And this work is funded by the Gates and the Lumina Foundation. These schools are around the country. Actually, this map's a little out of date. We're beyond 60 and counting in, in three countries outside the US. Most of these schools are public, part of districts. Some are charter. There are a few other ways that they were established. It seems to make less difference how they were established and what their control is than the model. These are small, personalized, intensely individualized schools in which each student's own interests are the basis for project based and community internship learning. Uh, there's an advisor structure in which a small group of students stay with the same advisor, their teacher, for four years from ninth to twelfth grade. They are intensely relational. And there is a very explicit college going culture, assistance, and uh, dedicated staff for college going. So who goes to these schools? First of all, they're not selective. This isn't a plucking out the gifted out of underperforming schools. These are neighborhood lottery schools. So anybody who wants to attend can. And the people who attend big picture schools are the folks who are most at risk for dropping out of high school and for failing to access higher education. Um, primarily students of color, low income students who would be the first in their family to attend college. You can see that the big picture has um, gained international attention for the fact that they graduate nearly all of their students and they have nearly all of their students accepted to college. And this is in comparison with the top 50 urban centers in the US graduating just over half on average and in some cities much fewer from high school um, and few of those students going on to college. You will also see, however, or I don't know if you will see, I think it's below the surface of the table. Um, so 95% of big picture students are accepted to college. 66% um, of them enroll in college the fall after they graduate from high school. That's, that beats by far the just over 50% of low income students nationally who attend college, but still, Whoa, what happened? 95%? Where'd they go over the summer? Hold that thought. That's a really important one that'll get us straight to the heart of the problem. Um, another slide just to give you some idea of the success of big picture schools in outperforming the local public schools that in most cases would be the ones where the students would go and possibly graduate. 
um, in a student's own words about her big picture school. It was pure love from my advisor and everybody that pushed people and carried people to where they needed to be. And I didn't even want to say that they carried us. They taught us to walk on their own. Sounds pretty good. So let's look at how they got to college or didn't get to college. First of all, how do people get to college? Here's the major college uh, choice model that's uh, empirically based. Ideally, this is how you get to college. You see a need to go. You have a sense of what college is going to give you. You aspire to go. You expect to go. You want to go. You are qualified to go. Notice only that last one explicitly deals with college readiness, that is academic preparation, although it's implicated in the others. You look for a college that fits you. You investigate what you're qualified for, what you and your family can manage, what you're interested in, what you want. You choose a school from the ones that accepted you. You send in a deposit on May 1st, National Send in a Deposit Day, to signal that you're coming and to have the college hold you a place. You show up at that college in the fall. That's actually how I did it, and maybe a lot of you in this room. But now let's look at what has to happen in each stage. Asking whether college for you is for you is actually getting us into social and cultural capital territory that is normally transmitted in families and peer groups. As Secretary Revel said, a platform of advantage that is not equivalent for all students. To quote an African-American student, both because he says this very clearly and to make the point that this is not necessarily about ethnicity or race, per se, both my parents went to college. It's kind of like you have to do it. I was the last kid. I'm the youngest. So it's like you definitely have to go to college. It's nothing that I wanted to resist. I always wanted to go to college. Sounded good. Didn't cross my mind not to go. It's a middle class student. What do you do after high school? You go to college. But each of these issues is way up in the air for students who would be the first in their family to go to college. A Latina student. My family doesn't know that much about college, doesn't know how it works. And all or most of the things they say are, how are you going to pay for college? Go to a community college. I've done the paperwork by myself and with the help of Kathy, her college transition counselor. But it's been hard because it almost seems that with me and my family, it's only me that can do it. And it's extra hard because there's no one telling me, oh, look, here's how you do it. I have Kathy, and she's helped me a lot. But I don't have a sister or mother to say, this is how I did it. This is what you can do. Everything is first try. Big picture schools take care of this because they know not all the families can or will. They have a college-going culture, a college knowledge curriculum. They require all students to apply to college. And they help them do so, and for financial aid. Everybody's involved, teachers, transition counselors, learning through internship mentors. Big picture parents want their students to go to college and have a good, secure life. This is why they sent them to these schools. But then again, what if your family doesn't know about or take care of all the items on that block because they don't have knowledge about how college works? Or for that matter, home internet access? Or fluent English? Or a working car? Again, big picture schools do all of this. They take the students on college visits. They, do, uh, they fill out their federal financial aid form with them, et cetera. Once you're accepted, how do you know where to get in? Students choose, by our students, based on our research, choose by the following three things in order. Cost, location, and major. And cost is usually perceived, not necessarily actual cost. Again, big picture works with students on these matters. So big picture has worked really carefully to align all these factors to provide that platform of advantage. And here we reach deposit day with students ready to graduate in much greater percentages than the other kids in their neighborhoods. They are ready for college. They're accepted there. And they've received financial aid because they've also been required to apply for that. They've sent a deposit to college. Success, right? Remember that gap between the accepted and the went to college. The following September, three months later, a third of those students are not enrolled anywhere, and another third are enrolled somewhere different than the place to which they sent their deposit. Um, being accepted to college is still not the end of college access. 
So what on earth is going on? And we've done a couple of studies to follow up this finding. And we've also along the way discovered that this is far from uncommon in um, first generation low income students. In fact, um, it's well known, but fairly absent from the policy discussion. So what happened? We're calling it the summer flood. And it seems that there are a bunch of things that go on the summer after college um, that cause students to continue to apply, to change their mind, to decide not to go. Their carefully aligned paths fall apart. Number one reason, and number two, three, four, and 10 reason, financial aid, money. Most of these students have a zero estimated family contribution on their federal financial aid form. Their average gap between the price of uh, their financial aid award and the price of tuition, not getting on a bus to travel to the school, not buying a book, is four to $8,000. This is enormous in a family where it's an issue that your $12,000 you're bringing in from your after school job at Dunkin' Donuts is a major chunk of your family income. So um, the reality set in. What does it mean to go that much in debt? This is a lot of money. Or I'm willing, um, me and my family are willing to get, go into debt, but, um, but we can't get a loan. Loans are hard to get, the paperwork's confusing. There's nobody in my life who has the credit worthiness to be a co-signer on the loans. I, I just cannot stress enough um, how central the financial aid issue is. Second set of issues, they're counter pulls to keep people with families and jobs and communities. A lot of these relate to social and cultural ties. There are counter pushes. All sorts of things are happening over the summer related to families and communities living on the edge. There are also unwelcoming messages to many students who were conditionally accepted to college and they see the communications from the colleges as harsh and unwelcoming. Incomplete tacit knowledge, the unwritten knowledge that middle class families with a background of higher education just kind of know um, about how colleges work, about how to manage the, the transition, the inability to envision the unknown or to believe, really believe that this can and will work out. So to give you just some examples, consumer naivete, a student, I found a scholarship on eBay, should I buy it? Yeah, after all, the scholarship was for $1,000 and only cost $500. Wasn't that a good, good deal? Doubt. A grandmother to her, to her granddaughter. If you don't do anything else, go to college. If you don't make it, at least you can say you went. Or a student. Maybe it would be cool to go to college for a few years. Not like promising myself anything, but maybe give it a try. Again, I need to stress, this is a best case scenario here. These are students who are ready for college, they want to go to college, they're accepted to college. And note that in our study of the summer flood, college readiness was not the issue. This ball of wax together with college um, readiness is all about how you actually get to college. So everyone needs to make choices and weigh odds and see themselves positively. Students hedge their bets because they see the dangers very clearly a student. For most of your childhood, they send you through school and they put you, push education so hard. And then when you finally, when it's time to go to college, they hit you with a big fat bill. Okay, we want you to go to college. You live in a society where you can't survive unless you go to college. But let's charge you millions of dollars and kind of set you up to fail. And I think that's ridiculous. So another reason I don't think I want to go to college and be in debt the rest of my life I don't want to go to college where, yay, I'll get so excited, be there for a month, have all those loans, and then I drop out. And then I have to, I don't have that fancy job. I don't have all that money coming in, and I'm kind of screwed. I'm not in school, and I have a huge bill to pay off. Really, it's scary. And I'm sorry to say that's actually exactly what happened to that student. So what to do? College readiness is the base. Absolutely nothing happens without that. But we need to provide all the elements beyond readiness. Teachers are an important part, but they can't do all that. That's not what they're about. This is a policy issue. It involves government and uh, lenders. It involves um, colleges um, tightening the handoff to plug the leak of the summer flood, 
building and sustaining relationships across the transition, which is David Bluestein's topic. I will leave you after this discouraging bit with some two pieces of good news. First of all, don't forget the big picture's success. Highly relational, real world relevant, college focused high schools can vastly increase uh, retention to the high school diploma, college readiness, and admittance to college. We can also get over the hump of the summer flood um, with a colleague whom you know, Ben Castleman. We've conducted an a experimental intervention study in which a randomly selected treatment group received systematic outreach by someone they knew over the summer after high school and a treatment and a control group was helped if they asked for it. And what we found is the treatment group was more likely to be enrolled in September, more likely to be in a four-year college, and more likely to keep the plan that they'd had in the spring. So the summer flood's another important building block, necessary but not sufficient to lead all the way to the degree. So I thank you and invite you to read and find out more about Big Picture Learning and the study. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I just want to get my... Um... Oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. I want to thank Dean O'Keefe for the opportunity to uh, speak here. I want to thank Secretary Revell for very inspiring and thoughtful comments. And I also want to thank Karen Arnold for very thoughtful comments and comments that I'm going to actually follow up on and hopefully illuminate a bit. Um, before I get to my actual talk, I just want to comment on a few things I heard from the Secretary. First off, um, and also from Provost Garza, I, our comments and our perceptions and impressions are actually very, very congruent. And I think when you begin to see a consensus like this, we begin to feel a lot more confident in some of the knowledge we're creating and knowledge that we're, we're reacting to in the policy sector. Um, so first off, I strongly endorse the need for college. I've been studying vocational psychology, psychology of working for 25 plus years. I'm very, very interested in uh, the impact of globalization and the huge transformations of post-industrial society. And uh, we're all on the same page on this. We have to ramp up our education. We have to ramp it up very, very fast. And the comment about us no longer being able to tolerate a bell curve is right on target. Um, in order for our country to succeed, to do all the things that Governor Patrick has in mind, the Secretary has in mind, and the President has in mind, we need to create more wealth. And the way we create more wealth is to improve the quality of our workforce and improve the quality of our entire workforce for all the reasons that I'll get to shortly. Um, my comments also build on the Secretary's seven challenges. I'm going to pick on just a few of those and follow up on them in, in a little bit more depth. Uh, first off, I do agree with the, um, the role of community colleges. I've been writing about this for many, many years. I think our community colleges are underutilized, and I think when we look at our educational system internationally, that is one of the secrets of what can help us recover is our community college system. I've traveled a fair amount uh, to Europe in particular, and our, our competitors don't have a system the way we do. We have the infrastructure in, in place and if, I think if the governor is able to fund those the way they should be funded, we'll really take off. Uh, I also want to make a brief plug here about Boston College's work in the STEM area. Uh, Mike Barnett, who's one of our very, very successful professors in science education, has attracted a great deal of interest from the National Science Foundation. And one of the things that we're doing here, and I also want to thank Catherine Wong, who's running our college-bound program. We've all collaborated, myself from the career development perspective, Mike Barnett from the science education perspective, and Catherine and her colleagues from the urban um, initiative perspective in trying to figure out a way to help reduce this uh, leakage, um, the opposite of a flood in our STEM pipeline. So my contribution focuses on one specific uh, cohort of ideas and it's on the role of relationships, and I'm going to define that a bit broadly here. So um, looking at the uh, issues of readiness, we obviously have all agree on this issue of the 21st century workforce demands. Uh, 
Um, there's a tremendous need for increased rigor in post-secondary education as well as in secondary education and throughout the K through 12 system. There are huge gaps here that the secretary commented on, that the provost commented on, and then there's continued lack of access to resources. Um, I, I think it's very humbling for any of us to um, compare the differences, for example, in the Commonwealth or any other state in the union between our affluent communities and our poor communities. It's, uh, if you don't walk away humbled by that, um, it's, it'll be remarkable. Uh, the strengths, we have some great strengths here. We have great strengths in, in the Commonwealth. We have committed public officials. I commend the Secretary and Governor Patrick. I've reviewed the readiness project in depth online. I think there's some great vision here. Um, and we also have great projects here in the School of Education. I think, you know, commenting on Erwin Blummer and Mary Walsh's work is right on target. We have some great ideas in Campion Hall, and I thank the Dean for helping us to create this uh, crucible of learning. So, um, the specific focus I have here is on um, trying to build on the Commonwealth's Readiness Project and really looking at how do we help students with limited resources among growing economic challenges. And my talk builds on perfectly on Karen's talk, and um, I don't know if we quite planned it that way, but it's, it's worked out well. Um, so what I want to look at here is, first of all, I want to give you the big picture of an adaptive transition. A number of years ago, some colleagues and I studied the school-to-work transition, uh, both for non-college-bound as well as college-bound students, primarily from poor and working-class communities. And we found four clusters of factors that promoted an adaptive transition. The first one, of course, are the academic skills and competencies. That's the, in many ways, it's the bottom line. We're all speaking about this. These are critical issues. Then there are three sets of non-cognitive factors. One is an active and supportive relational environment. The second um, includes an educational environment that, has an, that offers a rigorous and relevant connection between school and the 21st century workplace. And the third are psychological variables, such as initiative, planfulness, a future orientation, and a sense of purposefulness. What I want to talk about today is an area of research that I've done with Maureen, Co Maureen Kenny, who's the Associate Dean in the Lynch School, and a number of other students and colleagues throughout the school and throughout the country, which, in, which is built on the relational perspectives within education and psychology. Um, and I'm going to look at the relational perspectives from a broader, broader point of view than most scholars do. I'm looking at relational perspectives from the role of actual relationships in our lives, as well as from the role of internalized relationships. And I'm speaking about the internalization of relationships to people, as well as the internalization of our relationships to our goals and our future. And that builds on my work in the area of career planning. So uh, with Maureen, we've done a series of studies here at Boston College uh, wrapped around the notion of school engagement. School engagement is something that appeals to psychologists in a school of education because it's something that we could do something about. Uh, it's, a, it's a psychological, a psychoeducational, and social construct. And what it really taps into is this idea that students will feel engaged in school, will feel motivated to go to school, will feel like part of their identity is wrapped around being a student. And we've also found that school engagement is strongly connected to a future orientation and career planfulness. Uh, we've done research in the Boston Public Schools, and we've also done some recent research at the North Cambridge Catholic High School, which is part of the Cristo Rey Initiative, which is a wonderful initiative in the Catholic schools run by the Jesuit Order, so I am putting a plug in for the Jesuit Order. Uh, my, my allegiance to Boston College is, is evident here. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll be reviewing and integrating studies from both of these contexts. Um, so we've, Maureen and I and, and our students have used two kinds of methodologies here, quantitative research as well as qualitative research. Uh, we've looked at predictors of school engagement and we've also looked carefully, as Karen has done, using qualitative research, looking at the actual internalized experience of students and in their own words, in their own voices, heard from them about what kind of meaning they make about school, work, their engagement to school, and their relational resources and barriers. So let's look first at external relationships. Um, our research has yielded the following findings, many of which are common sense, 
Um, the first off is that teachers provide a great deal of support in K through 12, and we're particularly looking at secondary schools. Also, friends provide a great deal of support. However, and a lot of this is common sense, those of us who've had adolescents know this from our own life experience, that when the friends are oriented toward achievement in school, they're very supportive. When they're less oriented toward achievement, they can become a barrier. Now, some of this is what uh, we've often called in psychology, grandmother psychology. A lot of this our grandmothers could have told us. <laughs> but we have to have a living, so we've created this. But um, um, So we do have some, some interesting funnies that our grandmothers may not have told us. Um, my grandmother was very wise, and she told me a lot, and she probably would have said this, with a fourth grade education, mind you. Um, so families, families could also be very, very effective, particularly families that set boundaries for their kids. Okay, and a lot of this, of course, depends on the resources of the families. This is not in any way to blame the families. I've done a great deal of work in urban communities and in poor rural communities, and the families are simply overburdened, particularly now, with an unemployment rate that is skyrocketing, the need to work multiple jobs, the need to manage often multiple tasks simultaneously. So this is not a blaming the family situation. This is looking at some of the um, realities. And we do offer some recommendations here. There are barriers also in external relationships. This often is not dealt with uh, carefully in the psychological literature on relationships. Peers, as I've mentioned, maladaptive peers can be problematic. And we've also found in our research that loss of family support, particularly related to family misfortune, a death in the family, uh, loss of a job, these kinds of things can really throw a monkey wrench into the, um, into the source of support for students. Um, in addition, I just want to build on the fact that on, um, these relationship skills do provide one of the major sources of skills that we need for the 21st century workforce which is the need for teamwork, the need for collaboration, and the need for uh, an affirmation of diversity. This is key for us to have a very competitive workforce in the 21st century. We do need the cognitive skills of our workforce desperately, but we also need our workforce to be able to function well in a multicultural, multitasking environment and to be able to work well in teams. I tell my students that many of the jobs that were autonomous or solitary are being replaced, as we know, by automation. Many of us in this room remember when we'd call somebody and get a telephone operator. How many of you have received a telephone slip that says you have a message? In fact, we get so few telephone calls now that I'm surprised when my phone rings, because <laughs> everything comes on email. So I think it must be some kind of shock. But this is quickly, this tells you how quickly things are changing in our lives or how old some of us are getting. Um, so let's look first at internalized relationships. As a psychologist, I spend a fair amount of my time studying how we internalize our life experiences. And there's a fair amount of literature on this. And we do create relational schema. And these relational schema pr create uh, a framework for us to understand how we experience the world and how we experience our relationships. Another source of internalization is school engagement and we, in, we internalize beliefs and values about school, and another aspect of internalization are career plans and a future orientation. Um, so basically, I look at internalization as being the introjection, if you will, of beliefs, attitudes, and narratives. And these are also very amenable to change, which is one of the reasons why we study them. Uh, we also look at the essential role of internalized relational connections in all aspects of life, but today I'm gonna focus on these uh, internalized relationships in fostering an adaptive transition. One of the things we found in our research is that career goals promote school engagement. Uh, Associate Dean Kenny and I have seen this in multiple studies, that as students are able to develop long-term career plans, they're able to see the connection between school and work, they internalize it, and they're able to delay gratification. This is one of the differences, aside from the huge difference of financial resources that we see in more affluent schools, is kids can internalize this connection between school and work in families where they see a, um, a myriad of job prospects. If you're coming from the inner city or poor rural areas, you don't see a lot of different jobs in which school has helped you to get there. 
and it's hard to dream about a future. One of the things we've done in our projects in the urban schools is try to help the kids dream of a positive future. Um, we've also uh, studied work-based learning, which is a key aspect of the Cristo Ray schools. Um, the Cristo Ray schools have developed this work-based model in part to help the kids pay for their education. And I think one of the things that Maureen and I have helped them to do is look at the fact that they have in some ways looked at the golden goose. The golden goose is helping the kids to get evidence of the school to work connection by working in jobs that connect them to the adult workplace. This is essential. Many adolescents work in the adolescent workplace and they're not really getting adult socialization. They're not really getting the kind of mentoring that they need. In the Cristo Ray model, the kids work at universities, hospitals, businesses, often at not very high level jobs, receptionist, other kinds of jobs, but they're getting adult mentoring. They're seeing people in adult work roles. It has a huge impact. We've seen this in the schools, in the uh, Cristo Ray schools. We've also seen it in the schools in, the, in Boston where kids are provided with explicit connections between school and work. So, because I don't have a lot of time, I'll just summarize with some brief recommendations that come out of these relational perspectives. One is, as educators and policy um, officials, we can provide guidance for families in setting boundaries, okay? There's been an interest in the Boston Public Schools on doing parent education. This is part of a number of initiatives and reform efforts. And without coming across as in a patronizing way, we can do this in a culturally embedded way of trying to help parents find ways to set limits for their kids. Um, we could also help um, our schools provide greater access to adult mentors. This particularly would be very important in um, what Karen described as the big flood. If we can provide in these particular juncture points where we're seeing a huge leak of students moving from high school to college, I think as you found, having people call up the kids, having the kids learn some of the instrumental skills of um, how to negotiate financial aid, how they can make these decisions between college, work study, and financial aid, but also providing some confidence, this can help a great deal. So adult mentors can help significantly. We need to help students learn how to negotiate peer relationships. This often gets tossed aside in the movement toward you know, high levels of MCAS scores, high levels of cognitive skills, but if we, I have been in the Boston Public Schools and I've seen some of these peer relationships run awry and um, you know, it's often hard to get the kids to pay attention when their friends are telling them it's just not cool to be a good student. And we could do things about that. There are actually researchers in the Lynch School who are studying peer relationships who can help us develop the tools from scholarship. Uh, we need to enhance teacher support. Uh, it was very nice to see the teachers honored here. I could acknowledge some of my teachers um, back in the New York City schools who to this day I still feel very grateful that I had um, who played a key role in me getting to this, this point. Um, so the teachers who support our students deserve a great deal of credit and we, we've got to find ways, as the Secretary said, to acknowledge them, to, to uh, affirm them and to help them develop meaningful careers that offer advancement and offer increased salaries. This is key. We shouldn't be paying our teachers um, such modest salaries. They really do need to be paid equivalent to the rest of the professionals. And we need to provide students uh, with structured work-based learning at adult work sites. I was a very keen fan of the school to work movement in the 1990s, uh, a movement that didn't get as much play in the recent uh, administration, the federal administration. Um, however, we have a new administration now, both in the state and in the um, White House, and it, I think we need to return to thinking about the school to work connection and thinking about college as a mediating factor in that connection and thinking about people getting to 21st century jobs, many of them through four-year colleges, but also many of them through community colleges. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you, Secretary, for your comments. They were very informative.